Then I'm asked to go to America, and in America I was asked this, um, we're trying to reach our communities, we've heard about what you're doing, especially with young people, we'd like you to come here, help us in our area, with our students, and then we'll spread this. And things changed, the pastor who asked me to come flew to Willow Creek as I kind of flew into Dallas, so uh, it kind of got a bit complicated, but... Um, I kind of, what we did then was we began to concentrate on this second idea, this idea of true discipleship. Um, I've been married 20, um, in two, three weeks time, I've been married 24 years. And uh, I come from a very different background of my wife. So my family is very conservative. I have a dad and a mum. Uh, there's me and my brother. It's male orientated. Uh, it's, very, it's very kind of typically English. Uh, my wife's background, her family was a little bit dysfunctional in that the father um, was a, w- wasn't the best father, let's say, and uh, eventually he kind of left the house. So it's her and um, four sisters. They had two bathrooms. It wasn't enough, okay? It was a completely different environment. Uh, and when I proposed to Lynn, when I basically, I'm going to use Dean, okay? Because... He looks a little bit more like my wife, which is very scary. No, he doesn't really. <laughs> do you not think Dean, do you not know, think he looks like, um, he, re, he reminds me of Christopher Reed, if you had, uh, what do you think, with dark hair? Yeah? Okay, cool. Anyway, sorry to embarrass you. I didn't mean to. He did wrestle, man. <laughs> he did wrestle, yeah. So, imagine, so when, I say to, when I said to Lynn, hey, Lynn, will you marry me? And she said yes. If somebody had gone and took a flash photo and turned it into a cartoon, you know in cartoons you have like speech things and you have like think bubbles don't you speak what they call speech something or others you know what i mean and think bubbles if you'd looked at that photo you'd have seen two think bubbles i said will you join me in this and she said yes i'll join you in this and for the last 23 years we've been trying to work out the differences Yeah? yeah i think when jesus said go and make disciples we said oh yes we'll do this and we've got a totally different idea from what he was thinking. Now, I haven't, got to, I, haven't got, I haven't got the time to go into the different ways, but we have six ancient methods as we rediscovered what true discipleship really is. And what we realise is this. It is not this idea of an educational um, kind of top-to-bottom thing where you've got, let's say, the pastor, let's just say, and the pastor's been there and done it, and now everybody else is kind of like, he's, we go to the church to be educated how to do what the Bible tells us to do. What we discovered was that actually we needed to rethink what discipleship looked like with these young people. And we came up with this, uh, don't worry about the uh, uh, diagram, it's just to help you. We came up with this idea of, um, I'm going to use pays now, so we've got a founding director. And then you've got the national directors. And then you've got the hub directors. And then you've got the team leaders, team, and all this means nothing to you at the moment, team members, uh, students, members, and students, friends, and family. And what we decided was, actually, the, the real model of real discipleship is not top to bottom, it's front, it's leadership. Discipleship is not, come with me to Starbucks, we'll open the Bible, and I'll ask you some awkward questions about the things you've been watching this week. That's not what discipleship, it might be an element, but it's not what discipleship, discipleship is this, hey, you come with me, I I hear you're interested in the kingdom of God, you come with me, I'm going to a local apartment block, we're going to serve that area, and if you want to see what the kingdom of heaven looks like when it touches earth, come with me and I'll show you, and then I'll, I'll answer your questions as we walk along the journey, that's not what we do, is it, that's not what our churches do. We, dis- we, we reach them, we give them presentations, we try to get them saved, and at that point, then we educate them and tell them what they're supposed to go out and do as disciples. So we've got to rethink a little bit what discipleship actually looks like. And that was really, really keen to us. Now, we, at one point, in one situation, got stopped because what was said is, hey, you can't get these kids going out and sharing their faith because they don't know yet all the four spiritual laws. They don't know this and this and this. So let's bring them back to the centre. Let's educate them enough. And then when they're ready, we'll send them out. I don't, where's that? Somebody please show me. We, we, it was really effective. Our, our youth ministry grew. But more importantly, the effects of the youth ministry 
really change. So my question then is, what would it look like if the whole of the church did that? That's scary, isn't it? Because what we'd really like, somewhat, maybe me, I'm not going to reflect this on you, what I'd really like is just go on a Sunday and listen to Kevin, because I really enjoy Kevin's sense of humour, and I love his teaching. Amen. <laughs> there you go. That's what I'd really like to do. Do I really want to get involved in something that's going to challenge me, that I can make disciples? I can be a disciple who makes disciples, and whose primary purpose is not to make sure I turn up every week and pay my dues, but their primary purpose is to empower, equip, and encourage me to make a difference. And these leaders, their primary purpose is to equip me in the work that I do for the kingdom of God. It's an interesting question. So these were, the, again, I'm not going to the ancient methods. We have six ancient methods to help young people do that. I'm just giving you an overview, if that's okay. Uh, and then what happened was, after a while, we uh, decided that the church had changed its ethos with the new pastor and, and God was calling me to do full-time uh, pays. And we worked with a group of guys, and I want to spend a little bit more time on this, um, thinking about what it, how do you do this? How do you, how do you become a person who lives above the line? How do you become a person who even wants to do that kind of stuff? Maybe that's just not the way we're wired, naturally. So how, we, how do we do that? And what I realized is that one of our problems was that the way we taught the Bible was adding to this kind of living problem. Very superficial. Most people were fairly bored. They'd been a Christian for five or six years and had heard most of the lessons. There wasn't really much new to learn. Really, you went back to church to be told, to reminded of the same thing. And it was presented, there was no real participation. So generally you got a person's perspective. Now that perspective may be right, but it's one perspective. It's a bit like this idea. If you look at this cylinder from just this point of view, you're going to see a rectangle. If you look at it from just this point of view, you're going to see a circle. It's when you get the two perspectives, you realise actually there's more to this than a circle or rectangle. There's a cylinder here, yeah? It's three-dimensional. You know, this is three-dimensional, at least. But we don't always see that. Now, what we rediscovered, I'm going to spend just a little bit more time on this one, is that there. In Jesus' day, it, later on in the Middle Ages, a little bit later, they look back at the Second Temple period when Jesus was ministering and they realised that actually there were four levels, I'm going to call them, of understanding Scripture and then passing it on. Now, it had a word and it's been, this word is uh, been stolen, if you like, by uh, kind of mystics and Gnostics and stuff, but the basic thing is called Pardis and it means orchard or park, or garden. And I love to connect this with the parable of the sower. And there were essentially there were four uh, levels, if you like, of digging down into Scripture. Now we're sharing this because what we're interested in is what would this look like if not just be young people or on pays, what if a church was trained not to come and hear what I thought, but trained to dig themselves what would that look like? So the first level of this is called, I'm going to use the Hebrew words, okay? It was called Peshat. And Peshat means simple. It is the obvious meaning of a passage. So Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Peshat of that is that God created the heavens and the earth and it was in the beginning. Okay? It's kind of simple. Later on in the Bible, things get a bit more complicated and to fully understand, like that, that, that passage, let's say, of born again, if you don't know the context, it's difficult. And one of the premises is this, if you miss Jesus' context, you miss his point quite often. 